Um, just before I start, I just want to check, does anyone live in Port Carlisle? I know Daphne, you're just on the edge. Anyone? You're Port Carlisle. Brilliant. Um, I guess most people have visited Port Carlisle, been through it. Um, so some of this won't be new to you, um, but um, there's a few different strands to the project that I've been doing in Port Carlisle. Um, it was funded through a community grant from the Solway Wetlands. Um, and the aim of it is to um, do the conservation area appraisal um, with local people, but also celebrate uh, the history and the heritage of Port Carlisle um, locally and wider. Um, uh, and because it's a, a community-based project, I'm just there to kind of coordinate and, and help make things happen. Um, but we have kind of gone off on different tangents and done different things depending on um, kind of what the community group have wanted to do. So we did do a Christmas sing-along, which um, uh, didn't really have much to do with the built heritage, but we held it in the, the Methodist Chapel, um, which is a, a really interesting historic building in Port Carlisle. Um, so yeah, we've done lots of different things. Uh, but the very first image there, um, you can see um, Solway House, um, built as a hotel, um, terraces of houses there, um, a warehouse there, which is now a house, customs house there, the bath house, um, and then this is um, a ship called the Robert Burns. Now this was a really um, uh, big ship, not um, built for going up the canal, but would have wharfed alongside this dock and met ships that were coming up and down the canal. Um, so we'll get on to the whole kind of history and, and what happened, but I think that's a really um, important um, piece of evidence to show what was happening in Port Carlisle. Um, and this links quite well to what uh, Anne was talking about, in that um, this area is you know, great for nature and bogs and all that kind of stuff. You probably tell my interest is built heritage, so I don't know about the, the bog stuff so much. But there was lots of stuff going on, um, industrial heritage, railways, canals. Um, so there's a lot of... Uh, oh, and there's the Romans. Um, yeah. <laughs> the Romans were here and um, built a wall. And you know all about that. Um, so yeah, the line of the wall goes straight through Port Carlisle. course of the Vallum there. Um, so this is kind of uh, looks at the different layers of significance. So when we talk about um, significance, there's lots of different scales. So the local scale right up to the international scale. So with the, the Romans, we do have international designation of World Heritage Site. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, the area of outstanding natural beauty. We have conservation area. And then within that, we've got protected buildings. Um, so part of this project was about working together locally um, to celebrate that and potentially make it even better than what it is. Um, another strand of this project, um, North of England Civic Trust, who I work for, um, have links with Europa Nostra and we've been involved in some of the uh, European projects. Um, so we um, submitted Port Carlisle to be entered into this um, Entopia project, which is our places in Europe, which is very much about local people in um, places um, that have uh, significant heritage, um, celebrating them uh, however they want to. So there's a couple of uh, entries from Albania, Romania, and then here, Port Carlisle. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, other people haven't kept up with the pace of our project, so we are um, uh, kind of unique in having done so much research. We've got a conservation area appraisal drafted, we've got um, other things kind of in the pipeline that I'll talk to you about. Um, so we are beating everyone else. Um, not too sure what they're doing, but um, it does kind of helps put Port Kyle on the map in the international um, sphere. Um, so when we talk about conservation area character appraisal, it just sounds quite dry and boring, but actually it's not. Um, but there's different levels to uh, what we're looking at. So um, we're going to cover, hopefully, five things. Um, ooh, that's it. That bottom one is maybe where 
as a community group, we're not going to get to. But we have done understanding, learning, sharing, and celebrating. Um, so understanding, um, when we talk about character appraisal, the appraisal is about the understanding and the significance, and then the management plan, which usually is attached to a conservation area appraisal, um, looks at the risks and issues, and then the policies. So understanding is what have we got. Significance is how important is what we've got. Um, risk and issues, so what is the problem? Um, what could the risk be to the heritage? And then policies is what shall we do about it? So we are um, looking at this section definitely. The management plan is maybe um, for something in the future. So what have we got? Okay, just took some dates at you there. But um, prior to kind of early 1800s, uh, Port Carlisle was known as um, Fisher's Cross. There wasn't much there. There was um, a farm, it was rural, um, and not many other buildings. Then in 1807, they first discussed the idea of a canal to link um, with the industries in Carlisle. Um, it took some time to get going, and so in 1819, they got an Act of Parliament, um, and they had Thomas Telford come and survey the route, um, and he costed the canal at £109,393. Um, so quite a lot of money. Um, so from uh, the Act of Parliament in 1819, work began in uh, 1820 and opened in 1823. Um, and uh, the canal itself was 11 and a half miles long, uh, rises 60 feet and has got eight locks along the length of its route between Carlisle and Port Carlisle. Um, now, it wasn't until the canal opened that Port Carlisle became co called Port Carlisle. Um, and it was at the gala um, dinner, 160 shareholders in the Carlisle Canal Company um, sat down and said that, uh, you know, we can't have it called Fisher's Cross, it needs a grander name. So that's how they came up with the name of Port Carlisle. Um, so it was used to transport um, mainly coal when the canal um, opened. The price of coal kind of plummeted overnight um, because the access was improved vastly. So this really helped the industries in Carlisle. Um, but it also created um, a, a link um, to, um, well, to the coast and then down to Liverpool um, for um, steamboat packets. So in 1826, um, the first steamboat launched between Carlisle and Liverpool, um, and that was named the Solway. Um, that carried passengers and goods and was lavishly fitted out and even had a dining room. <coughs> um, so from uh, the 1830s, when the Newcastle to Carlisle Railway opened, um, Port Carlisle became the port for um, uh, people to access um, the steamer and then emigrate to America. Um, and there's some figures here from the Carlisle Journal in 1831. Um, it said, during the previous month, upwards of 60 families have emigrated to America via Port Carlisle. Um, and even though many people were coming across from the northeast, many of these families came from Botchergate and Warwick Bridge. Um, so, um, a couple of other dates there. They discussed enlarging um, the canal in 1835, I and mean, I've got some plans of that. Um, 1844, the baths opened. Um, 1847, they first discussed converting the canal to a railway, um, and then the canal closed, railway opened, and that line ran in various forms until 1932. So you've got <coughs> huge change um, from kind of early 1800s to 1930s. Um, so rapid kind of building, you know, huge engineering um, as well. And obviously there's lots of changes relating to people, um, which um, I know Susan's going to talk a bit more about the oral history stories and uh, the people side of things. Um, so that's just a, a bit of a blurry map, but the red uh, circle is um, the end of the canal in Carlisle, just behind McVitie's. Sadly, there's not much of it left. And then the line coming all the way to Port Carlisle there. <coughs> So that's an aerial view of Port Carlisle. Hopefully that'll be um, familiar to you. Um, it's hard to see on this one, but you can just about make out the line 
of the canal coming down there, sweeping round to the entrance there. Um, so this um, settlement has changed very little from kind of its heyday in the 1840s um, through to the present day, which is why it's been designated as a conservation area. Um, it's another image there. It's a bit blurry, but it's easier to see the line. See it coming along there. This is the large <coughs> turning circle and then out to the Solway. That one's a bit better. Here you can see um, the turning circle all silted up. Um, but that was the line of the canal, later filled in for the railway platform here, which we've got a better picture of. And then the station for the railway was there, which is now the car park. Um, but you can see these lines of grand terraces here, Solway House, and then a couple more terraces and the pub there. Um, so this map um, is from kind of 18, well, after 1861, because the Methodist Chapel is on, um, so kind of late 1800s. Um, and if I just quickly flick to that one, this is the modern day map. You can see very little has changed. The main changes, if we go back, are around um, where the bowling club is now. Um, this had turning circle for the railway, um, engine shed, um, and another kind of little shed there. Um, but everything else is exactly as it was. Um, so we go back to this, you can see, so this is, um, there's still some of the canal left here, and the turning circle, and then the railway's coming in, station there, um, turning circle for the railway at the end there. Um, now, you can see on there, this uh, large structure here um, is known as the coaling wharf. Now that um, is later than the canal, but earlier than the railway. Um, so, if we just, oh, I've got a cooler picture, sorry. I'll just, so this is the canal entrance here. Um, two warehouses, which are now um, residential houses. Again, that's the canal entrance, so there would have been lock gates here. And this is the turning circle. Um, it's quite hard to kind of get into and take a picture of, because um, it is uh, pretty silted up. But on all sides, there are sandstone, um, dressed sandstone walls um, marking out this circle. Um, which are now quite kind of vegetated um, and covered up. This is the second uh, lock gate. So if I just. Uh, no. It's just before you get into the canal. Yeah, if I go back, uh, I can see on here. So we've got, uh, there was a, a lock gate here at the entrance, turning circle here, and then a second lock gate, probably about there. Um, <coughs> which you can see very high quality dress sandstone um, kind of recess for the gate there. Again, a bit covered in vegetation, but hopefully you can see that. So this is that plan from 1835 that I mentioned. Now, um, the canal was making money. It was quite um, profitable, but they wanted to make even more money, as uh, companies like to do. Um, so they proposed building um, a floating dock that would have had this large inner dock here and an outer dock here. Um, so there you've got the two warehouses um, that are still there, canal entrance that's still there, and then this jetty, the wooden jetty that uh, ran out into the Solway. So that's a very grand plan. Um, now, it didn't happen, but what <coughs> did happen was the stone dock that I pointed out on the map. Um, so this was mainly for the large um, coaling vessels um, to moor up on this dock, transfer to the smaller um, barges that could go up and down the canal. So this is the stone dock at high tide, and uh, this is quite hard to see uh, in this light, um, but you might be able to make out there's a flight of steps there. Um, again, very high quality dressed sandstone, 
um, and then that's the top of the dock. So some huge blocks here. I mean, this would have been quite a, a feat to build this. Um, my picture jumped about. But um, so they didn't do the whole kind of inner and outer dock, but they did do the coaling wharf, which kind of led to more trade in Port Carlisle. Um, and then, so from the 1830s to the 1840s, um, the kind of main phase of building took place, which is the, the Georgian terraces fronting onto the street. Um, Solway House Hotel, um, which is now three properties but was built as a hotel, um, had a period of being a temperance hotel as well. Um, and um, the Solway House Hotel was described um, by the Carlisle Journal as one of the pleasantest and most commodious houses on the shores of the Solway and is kept by one of the kindest and most hospitable hostesses that ever gave welcome to a traveller. <laughs> so I think that's a five-star review on TripAdvisor. Um, so yeah, by the 1840s, although um, there were still kind of boats um, carrying coal and, and other goods, Port Carlisle had become kind of a, a tourist destination. <coughs> Um, so it was the place to go. Um, you can go on a day trip from Carlisle. People obviously stayed in the hotel. Um, and then in the 1844, the Victoria Baths building um, was built, um, which had hot and cold salt water baths. And by the end of the 19th century, it even had showers. Um, so that was a reason in itself to go to Port Carlisle, was to experience um, a cold salt water bath. Um, so again, this is just some more of uh, the terraced houses, some really nice details. So some of the things we've been looking at as part of the conservation area appraisal is to look at the history um, and discover what happened, but also look at um, features and characters and things that um, we think are significant. So here we've got um, you know, really nice cobbled frontage to the properties. Um, every doorway in Port Carlisle is slightly different so um, you've got these really nice um, semicircular um, fan lights, uh, rectangular ones, different um, stone uh, dressings and features, little lamps. Um, so these are the types of things that when you're doing the character appraisal, um, these are, you know, you flag them up as being significant features um, and these add to the character of the area. Um, we've also got a bit of Roman stone. Um, this is in Heskett House, which used to be a pub, um, but there's a Roman um, engraved stone above the doorway there. And this is the baths building. Um, so you can see they're advertising hot and cold baths and a shower bath. Um, so, um, if we go back a slide. The um, 1847 trade directory listed um, all of the occupants and services in Port Carlisle. Um, and these are of many and varied. Uh, and I won't read them all because it's a big long list. But it included a surgeon, um, ship owners, grocers, joiners, butchers, um, a bootmaker, a blacksmith, um, an engineer, a linen draper, and seven master mariners. Um, so it would have been, you know, quite a bustling place, lots of um, different um, shops um, and different uh, industries. Now, um, I said the canal did quite well. Obviously, with the coming of the railways, canals were um, pretty much uh, kind of doomed in, uh, in many places. Um, and this is what happened at Port Carlisle. So in 1847, um, they discussed um, filling in the canal and uh, converting it to a railway. This was, uh, the problem with the canal was exacerbated by sandbar as well, and there's a very complicated story about um, a, a pier being built further along the coast, which meant that the sand um, built up and boats could no longer access um, the canal at Port Carlisle. Um, but also, obviously, railways were faster, new technology, um, so the Carlisle um, Canal Committee agreed um, to converting uh, the canal in 1847. Um, it took them until 1853 to get um, the Act of Parliament. Um, but the current journey on the canal between Port Carlisle and Carlisle was taking three hours by canal. 
um, and the railway journey they estimated to be under half an hour. So uh, it made sense. So the canal closed permanently in August 1853 and work began immediately to convert it to a railway. So the route is almost the same route um, as that taken by the canal, just a few um, different um, uh, bits of route. Um, and you can see here, so it, it had its own station, even though it's the end of the line, you've got a station building here. Um, this is the, um, the famous um, one-horse dandy, um, which ran along the line. So the line was used for trade, um, but not for very long, um, because uh, it opened, so the line opened in 1854, but just two years later, um, the branch line to Silleth opened in 1856. So all of the trade went through to Silleth, and Port Carlisle was kind of, uh, the railway was redundant. <coughs> Luckily, the railway didn't close straight away, and they used it um, for the tourists. So you got this um, horse-drawn dandy that was... Uh, going uh, up and down the line. There it is, full, uh, full to bursting. Yeah, I think that's a bit much for one horse to take. Hopefully they got off uh, once it was moving. Um, but you can see it's uh, popular. Um, and then it was, uh, so the last horse-drawn dandy ran um, in 1914. Um, and then they introduced a steam engine. Um, so there's a picture of the steam engine. Um, outside the station. Um, the last steam engine ran in 1932. Um, but um, luckily the dandy was saved, and if anyone's been to the National Railway Museum, um, you might have seen this in situ there, the Port Carlisle dandy. So it's, um, it's been a popular place for tourists since kind of the 1830s. Um, I don't know if you can make out in the, this picture, that's the line of the platform there. So in terms of evidence of the railway in Port Carlisle, there's um, a few features, but the platform is uh, you know, the most um, evident. Um, and then Solway House, the former hotel, sitting behind that. So how important is all of this? Um, so as I said, we've got World Heritage Site, AOMB, conservation area. Within that, we've got 25 listed buildings. Um, so for a, a tiny village, that's a, a very high proportion of listed buildings. Um, two of those are uh, the lock gates on the canal. There's the scheduled monument, and then there's other land and marine designations um, as well. <coughs> now, importance is not just about designation. Um, how important it is locally and to the people that live there um, and, and visit it is equally important. Um, and one of the things that we did was to ask residents, you know, what, what they liked about living in Port Carlisle and what they thought was important. So there are just a few of the things that came up. Um, and obviously you've got a lot of the landscape nature, tranquility of the, the setting, uh, bird watching, the light. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, you really, there's amazing sunsets out here. So that's a really important feature. History and memories, so again, Susan's got uh, oral history to talk about, but the stories of people, and as Anne was saying, you know, the fact that we you haven't got stories of dismantling of the railway, but um, obviously I haven't found any real stories about the canal, but it'd be great to look into, you know, the people who built it and, and those kind of stories. Um, so those things make it important as well. It's not just about having things designated. Um, so, yeah, we've done the understanding, we've done the learning, um, the sharing. So these are some of the things we've done as part of the project. So David Ramshaw is the authority on uh, the canal. He came to do a talk in the chapel. Um, that was a sellout event, really, really good. Um, we did a local history day where we put on display everything that we'd found. Um, and that got really good attendance from local residents who came and told us even more um, and brought in lots of uh, documents relating to their houses and things. Uh, we've done some guided walks around the village, presentations, Christmas sing-along, as I mentioned, not really heritage related, but great fun. Um, interpretation panel is a, a key output of this project, and we've also got a celebration event planned for the 7th and the 8th. Now, 
These are some pictures of our, um, this was the local history day that we did in the chapel. Um, this is Roger who lives in uh, the main part of Solway House, so the middle of what was the hotel. And he brought in lots of documents and plans and um, some really interesting things. It was great. Um, ah, so this is um, the interpretation panel. So we have been working um, as a group with um, Marilyn, um, who's here, and uh, Sheila um, to uh, design uh, an interpretation panel that covers that industrial period of Port Carlisle. Um, so we deliberately said we're not interested in Romans. We don't care about Romans. We want to talk about the canal and the railway. Um, and this is um, uh, going to go on site fairly soon, um, and that will be launched on the, um, the April event. So you'll be able to see this in situ. Um, and I've had to cut off. We do have a timeline on the side here, but I had to cut that off to make this visible. Um, so we've used a historic map um, to kind of show the canal, the railway, um, the buildings, um, the stone dock, um, and hopefully people will be encouraged to walk round the village after seeing this. So this is going to go down here on the front, so on the, the Hadrian's Wall path, um, because there's a, a tendency for people um, walking the path, obviously, they walk along here, round here, cross over the canal, they might look at it and think, oh, what's that? Look at that. Um, we have there's quite a few anecdotes of people being stood here, walking past, and there's visitors looking out to that and saying, oh, that must be some of the, the Roman wall. Um, so this will help dispel some of those myths. But people do walk along here, along here, and then carry on to Bowness, because obviously they're eager to get to the end. But we're hoping that by having this here, people will be encouraged to kind of have a look around the village and see what else there is in Port Carlisle, because it is a fascinating place, so well worth spending kind of half an hour having a little wonder. Um, so, yeah, we've done all of those protecting. Now, this is where it gets trickier. Um, so what's the problem? Um, it is a conservation area. It's got listed buildings. There are some... Um, changes that have happened that um, are maybe um, not using traditional materials or maybe aren't appropriate for um, listed buildings. There's also a problem with, um, apart from the main road that goes through Port Carlisle, the back roads are um, undesignated and the owner lives down south somewhere, doesn't care, doesn't maintain them. So there is quite a lot of uh, potholes and puddles that locals have to keep kind of on top of. So that's a bit of an issue as well that does um, cause problems. Um, some of these um, aren't, uh, yeah. you know, they, they could potentially be at risk, but um, one of the, the questions is what, you know, what do we do about it? Do we, um, this, I think this is in very good condition underneath the vegetation, but you can't really tell because of the vegetation. Um, the stone dock gets um, <coughs> battered by the tides and the waves and things like that. Um, but what do we do about that? I mean, it's out in the estuary. Is it something that we want to um, kind of consolidate and repair, or do we let nature take its course? These are all kind of you know, the questions that need to be uh, thought about. And then the canal entrance itself, there is a bit of movement in that stone there. Um, and this, as part of our project, we haven't, you know, gone into great detail about the condition of things and, and what the risk is to their future. But it's worth kind of flagging that up. If, um, if we're going to understand it and, and know all about its history, how do we protect it for the future? Um, so what should we do about it? Um, this is where it's kind of open for discussion, debate. Um, so the project that I've been leading on doesn't look at you know, future protection um, and, and action. It is all about recording, understanding, sharing and celebrating. Um, but it'd be interesting to kind of get people's thoughts and maybe when we do the questions uh, session at the end and um, see what people think. Do we leave things to nature or should we intervene? Um, so yeah, interesting. Um, the celebration event on the 7th and the 8th um, do put that date in your diaries. We are having a two-day um, kind of extravaganza of uh, there'll be guided walks, um, children's trail, heritage trail, the unveiling of the panel, 
Um, so most of that will be on the Friday and then on the Saturday, the same again, and then Saturday night, a big party in the pub. Um, so yeah, do come along, it'll be great. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>